All right, we're at the International Women's Conference, and we like to say... I I heard heard it it through the the grapevine. Welcome. It's the AA Grapevine Half Hour Variety Hour, featuring the collected voices of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm Don, an alcoholic in Greensboro, North Carolina. Hey, Don. Hey, everybody. I'm Sam, an alcoholic in... Oh, I'm an alcoholic in the LAX Marriott for Prasa. For Prasa's sake. What are you talking about? (laughs) Prasa is the Pacific Region AA Service Assembly. And more about that is coming up next week, Don. Ooh, roving reporter. (laughs) Sam, thanks to AA and my higher power, I haven't had a drink since May 30th, 1994. Now, I've been tempted a few times over the years, but I was convinced that it wouldn't do anything good for me, that the pleasure just wouldn't last and that the misery would return. I was convinced I needed AA by all those failed attempts I made to control or to not drink before I got here. So I often say when somebody returns to AA, there's no shame in a relapse. I haven't relapsed since I came into AA, but I did a lot of relapsing before I got here. It's in the failure that I learned to surrender. Welcome back. Now, your story is different because you have relapsed in AA. That's right. So, you know, when I first came into AA, um, my first meeting was uh, when I was 18 years old. I didn't come back until I was 32 because I had a lot of consequences I needed to experience. But then I had my last drink in 2003, but I came to AA in 2002. Mm -hmm. So there were a lot of little start overs. And what was told to me then is that, you know, I wasn't slipping. I wasn't relapsing. I just hadn't even gotten any traction yet. (laughs) But then in 2003, I took my last drink and I got sober. Then comes 2012, when a moment of clarity presented itself to me, and I got honest with myself and others that the way I was using poppers and diet pills was not sober for me. So I reset my sobriety date then. I relapsed. I did not relapse on alcohol, but I still relapsed on something that changed my body chemistry. Yes. And so, yes, I relapsed while in the rooms. And it was in discovering that you cannot control this thing that you returned. And I never left. That's the thing for me, too. That's why I I tend to say it wasn't that I came back. I reset my date. I Uh stuck around the whole time. I just made a mistake. I started doing things my way instead of someone else's way. Well, Sam, you stirred up quite a controversy with a statement you made a couple of weeks ago, and we got some letters. Stephen S. wrote, I've been listening to the February 20th podcast, A Nudge from the Judge. The host made a statement that everyone relapses, all caps, which is not true. Through the grace of God and AA, I'm sober 38 years. A slip is not a prerequisite to long-term sobriety. I'd suggest someone corrects the host. Thank you. Let's play exactly what you said. One of the things that I heard, every single one of us relapses. Some of us do it all before we come into the rooms. And then some of us do it after we come into the rooms. But all of us relapse. Yeah. I did not say that everyone relapses who comes into the rooms after they come to AA. No. It's very much what you said, Don, when you were talking about this, that you relapsed a lot before you came to the rooms. Most of us, and I'm learning not to use absolutes as we'll follow up in the next statement, yeah. um, most of us did try to stop drinking before we came to AA, and we found that we couldn't. Yes, and that's what April writes about. She wrote, I was listening to a nudge from the judge, season four, episode eight, and you talked about everyone having a relapse. I disagree. I've never relapsed. I didn't even think about stopping drinking until the morning I stopped. I have 24 years. Well, you know, thinking about this letter, I asked a meeting how many people here 
never once tried to stop or control their drinking before they came to AA. And there was one person oh. who that was the case. So everybody's experience is different. And we get but one window into it. My window is I had to try to stop and fail, try to stop and fail. That's the way I got here. And that was my experience. And then once I was here, I still tried to stop and failed, still tried to stop and failed. It, what it boils down to is I should not have stated it exactly as I said it, because there are no absolutes. Mm -hmm. So I would change that to say that pretty much everyone has relapsed, some before they came to the rooms and some after. And this does not mean that once you come to AA, you need to relapse. <laughs> Absolutely not. Relapse is not required for recovery. Thank you, Stephen and April, for writing in. We really appreciate hearing all points of view from our fellowship. Please call in. Don, who's our guest today? Today's guest is our roving reporter, Cindy F., who collected interviews at the 59th International Women's Conference in Dallas, Texas, last February. We'll hear from Cindy and a few of her newfound friends. Hey, Don, how do I send Grapevine a donation? Since the Grapevine is self-supporting, we don't sell ad space in our magazines, on our website, or in our podcast. Grapevine doesn't even accept donations from AA members. What? If you want to support Grapevine, visit aagrapevine.org slash store. I'm an alcoholic. I come from Fairfax, Virginia. My home group is the Ashburn Women's Meeting, and my sobriety date is April 23rd, 1994. And Cindy, you have been traveling with a microphone at a conference. What's this conference about? I did, Don. This, this was fun. I went to the International Women's Conference that was held in Dallas, Texas, and it was a treat. It was the first time the women had gotten together in person since COVID. That was the first time I had been there. I tell you, when I first got there, I, I'm a big extrovert, but I felt a little overwhelmed because there's a lot of people there. And what I witnessed very quickly was this overwhelming, welcoming community. Like everyone was happy. Everyone was saying hello to everybody else. They didn't actually know them. People were dressed in all kinds of fun cowboy stuff and chatting it up. And it just felt like old home week, right? It just felt like, oh man, I fit right in here. Like it didn't matter if you were gay or straight or a mother or elderly or young, it was like a great mixture of people and it just, everyone was accepted. It was a really neat experience to feel so welcome just right off the bat. And I'm, I'm so glad I had an opportunity to go. And why are they all gathered there? What's the conference about? So the conference is for women in Alcoholics Anonymous. They come together every year in a different city. The next next location will be in Portland, Maine in 2024. Any woman's invited? Anybody who's sober. And what are the kinds of events that are offered? Oh, my goodness. They had all kinds of events. They had lots of meetings, lots of workshops, meetings with speakers, uh, meetings on different topics. They had a great archives area that had the history of women in AA. I'd never seen that before. That was super cool. That was from the local intergroup. How many people were there, Cindy? Oh, my gosh, it was packed. There were over 3,000 people at the hotel at the conference. And there were, I believe it was over 3,000 online as well. So they were calling in from all over the world. Women were calling in from the UK, from Ireland, from Canada, oh. Argentina. So there was a huge mix of all kinds of people participating. One of the workshop was for the Spanish women. Oh, yeah. So the Spanish women had their own Zoom meetings and they had some people in the room and then there's an actual Zoom meeting with women from I mean, local, but also from other countries speaking Spanish. You talked to someone who went to that meeting, yeah. I did. Well, 
were the guests who were there in Dallas from all over? Was that international as well? We had a nice board of the U.S. and the world, and you could put mm-hmm. your little pin on where you were from. And there were two from the U.K. I didn't get to meet them, but that was pretty cool. Cindy, can you give us a word portrait of the opening ceremonies? Just describe the scene. Yeah, wow. So the opening ceremonies, first off, it's in Dallas. So we all know everything's bigger in Texas, right? (laughs) And this did not fail us. The real kickoff was in the evening when they introduced the committee that put on the conference. They introduced all the different aspects of what you're here to do and who's here and what you can do. And then they introduced the chair of the conference. And this woman came in on a horse into the hotel and walked up in front of the stage and got (laughs) off the horse and then the horse went away and (laughs) i think everyone was just like is that a horse oh my god it's a horse you know so the place was dark except the horse had the light you know everybody was just enjoying themselves there was music playing and people were dancing and lots of people had cowboy hats on and Mm -hmm. they had their boots on i wore my cowboy boots because that's what you do when you're in texas right yes well let's listen to some of the interviews that you got from people attending the conference i'm originally from minneapolis minnesota my name is terry i am an alcoholic My sobriety date is December 31st, 2009, and my home group is the Terrell Group in Terrell, Texas. Uh, I attempted to get sober first in Minneapolis, spent the next five years trying to find my way, landed in Terrell, Texas, got sober by the grace of CPS. Mm -hmm. and then went out to California to find greener pastures, found a fabulous women's group who introduced me to the International Women's Conference, took me to my first one in Oahu, Hawaii. I mean, who doesn't want to go there? Great introduction. Uh, Yeah, and I am now the chair of the 59th International Women's Conference here in Dallas. What do you think the impact of having the IWC here in Dallas has had on the local groups here? Oh, man. We have been able to involve so many sober women houses. We have, you know, so many women who are less than a year sober. And I was just talking to a gal upstairs earlier, and she said, Terry, if it wasn't in Dallas, I would have never heard of this. And it's a blessing to have been on this committee for the last year. Um, She's suiting up and ready to go to Portland next year. She has a year sober. That's amazing. Very cool. And she hated service work. (laughs) We all hate it when we first get here because, you know, it's not about me. I know. I I get to have to. (laughs) And for me to see that many women with that many roles working together and then to get the feedback from the women who are joining us to say that was the most beautiful thing I've seen in a long time brings me to tears. That's, That's awesome. That is powerful for me. That's awesome. And there was a horse involved. That's my girl. That's my Daisy May. Tell me that story. I'm a clinical psychologist. My husband and I do equine therapy for veterans with PTSD. Mm -hmm. We work with the local juvenile probation. Uh, We do equine groups for the kids. We work with uh, battered women. Miss Daisy May was donated to us last year by a woman who said, I just want her to go be of use. And so we thought, my God, wouldn't it be great to bring a horse into the banquet room? And my husband said, we're not doing that. They just replaced the carpets. <laughs> and I said, I think they make poop bags. And he got a poop bag. And Miss Daisy May was like bulletproof. She, the only problem, she saw herself in one of the full-length mirrors. And she said, who's that other mare up here? She wickered at her a little bit. And then she went on about her business. I mean, that's my therapy horse, too, so she was really good for me that first night to get over my jitters, so Very cool. that's my girl. Hi, everybody. I'm Joan M. I'm an alcoholic, and my sobriety date is June 13th of 1973. My home group is the Monday Night Women Meeting of Clean Air Group in Dallas. What do you know about the history of the IWC and how it kind of came to be? I know only from word of mouth that comes through sponsorship through the ages, but they were in Kansas City 
and they were a group of housewives. They simply had a vision that they wanted to spread the message to other women still suffering outside their comfort zone, and so they decided to have a conference. Having a conference involves money, venues, and all of those business types of things for which they had no experience. They were women that were primarily nurses and teachers and mm -hmm. housewives. There was a lot of learning curve that had to happen, but they did grow. And they started in Kansas City. Started in Kansas City. If ever we don't have a city that wants to have the conference in any given year, we send the conference back to Kansas City. Nice. <laughs> so that's nice institutional memory. Yeah. And um, we stand on the shoulders of all the women that went before us. It, it wouldn't be a year without going to the conference because it's my annual refresher. It's, it's the day-to-day -day sobriety activity with the sponsor and the meetings and the mm -hmm. in, inventories and the 10 steps and all the things we do. And then for four days, we have an oasis. And it's in a city that we might have been in before or not but it's the experience of meeting with all the women from all over the nation and <laughs> the odd feeling of having a place to stay if you had to mm -hmm. anywhere in the nation. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just a marvelous experience. My name is Laura. I am from Durango, Colorado, the cornerstone group there. When did you get sober? Sobriety date is the 6th of July of 1997. I haven't met a stranger I go up to anyone and I can talk to them like I've known them all my life. It is so wonderful. So has anything made you cry? Good tears of joy when I hear they've overcome such great obstacles. So it is very emotional, but it's fabulous. There are miracles everywhere. <sighs> that unity is a force to be reckoned with that. Um, sharing our stories gives us strength. We identify with everyone. There's no one different than we are, mm. that we're all the same soul. Hello, I'm Amy M. I live in Colorado. I've been sober since uh, September 15th, 2005. Have you attended some workshops while you've been here? I've attended the Tradition 12 workshop, uh, We Drink No Matter What workshop, uh, the Straight Pepper Diet workshop. That's awesome, and that's a great topic worth exploring. I'm just Fun. moving forward in sobriety. What are your takeaways in general from the workshops? You know, and I, I think I got it at this conference that when I stick around through the meeting long enough, and when I actually make an effort to attend the majority of the workshop uh, that are being held and the speakers, I'm going to hear my story, and I heard my story more than a few times, and it's, it's just changed my perspective, as this type of stuff always does. My sobriety has changed yet again. My name is Margaret, and I'm an alcoholic from Midland, Texas. It's by God's grace that my dry date is February 15th, 1982. My home group now is the Noon Hope Zoom. It's a women's big book study we meet every day at noon central time. What do you think? I'm really impressed with the people. A lot of us came from the noon Zoom, but we're not hanging together. We're out meeting other people. Almost all of us have volunteered to do something. Greet, do a workshop, but that's the kind of group it is. How has that impacted your sobriety? I started into a traditions group right just as soon as I got through the steps. I became grapevine rep when I had two years for the whole Northwest Texas area, I find when I don't do enough service, it affects me spiritually. What would your hope be for new people in AA? Uh, that they find a group where they are nourished and loved and made to toe the line and made to work the steps and get through the steps with strong people that are big book based, that they are sponsored into service, not just thrown in. So what's your takeaway from this weekend? I just got through with two hours with a lady from Hawaii, and we actually know some people I met on Zoom who go to meetings in Hawaii. Perfect. Yeah. That's what these things do, right? <laughs> I'm uh, Carmen, an alcoholic, and I come from L.A., Aliso Viejo, and my sobriety date is um, August 10th, 1998. I do do some Orange County conventions and women's workshop, El Taller de Mujeres, 
for uh, Hispanic women. Mm -hmm. So that's been going on for eight years. So. Oh, fun. So what do you um, enjoy the most about coming to this International Women's Conference? Just seeing old friends, um, running into them. It's, oh my gosh, it's so beautiful. Listening to the, the newcomers as well. Oh my God, their shares. Amazing. That's what right. was one of the most powerful stories you've heard so far this week? Gosh, it was in this Spanish meeting uh, a newcomer was sharing. Oh my gosh, all the things that happened to her. And she was going to, or she will, God willing, will celebrate a year next week on the 28th and it's like oh my god it was so amazing she's like a miracle mm -hmm. she was about to die it's like oh my god her story i was in tears and it's like ugh, loved it you know so and she's spanish <laughs> speaking it's yeah. funny when they they're crying and we're saying oh i love that you're crying <laughs> yes i do i do I, I i feel it more i don't know why but when i hear a share and i cry oh my god it was amazing so <laughs> i love to cry so have you had any spiritual awakenings while you've been here? Actually, I just came from the uh, LGBT sharing, and it was really interesting to hear the stories of the, a lot of the pioneer women. They came out in Orange County, as where I'm from. They started the ash, alcoholic, sober, homosexuals. It's like, oh my goodness, I couldn't believe they had a club that they could go to and they could feel comfortable. And it's like, oh, be accepting. It's like, oh, there's a place where they were able to go. Old timers. And it's all about the acceptance of others, yes, right? Yes, exactly. If it hadn't been for them, where would I be? So yeah, that was very spiritual. And there's so many of those, if it hadn't been for them, yes. I wouldn't be here. You're a Spanish woman, yes. right? Yes. I know that that's a growing culture yes. in AA. You yes. Know? And if those first women didn't come and get sober, we'd right? still be waiting, right? Yes, and, and we're actually uh, working on having more. There's no such thing in Spanish as a women's group, and that's something that we started in Santa Ana, and hopefully it'll grow, and hopefully it'll bring in newcomers, and hopefully the old-timers, the old-timers women will accept it and understand that there is a need to have women together and uh, have meetings and share comfortably, safely. Yeah. It's important. Yes. It's one they, of the awarenesses I brought from this weekend was like, wow, it's really about safety, you know, that women have a safe place to go. Exactly. Because our stories can be different than the guys. Yeah, and especially the newcomers. You know, they're so vulnerable. They need a place where they can be safe and secure and they can share openly, not being, a, you know, 13 stuff. Carmine and you talk about safety and the importance of women's meetings for the new vulnerable women who come to AA. First, what is the 13th step you talked about for people who don't know? So the 13th step is is not a happy thing. It's not a good thing when somebody with lots of time meets and greets a newcomer, you know, at their first couple of meetings or a couple months in or whatever and tries to date them or get to be buddy buddy with them and there have been circumstances that um, you know these poor folks are not ready to be in relationship with anybody they're just trying to figure out who they are and right. all that stuff that we go through in early sobriety of trying to figure out which end is up quite frankly how to live life without alcohol and 13th stepping happens sometimes if groups aren't real strong and, and they're not talking to old timers and saying, hey, back off, man, you know, she's just got here or, or he just got here and they should be protected. And, and we in AA feel that that newcomer has a right to be there and that they should have the ability to get sober without interference. And then, you know, there's a phrase for a year, don't make any major changes, right? So after a year, if you want to go date somebody, go to town, right? But we hope you've gotten the tools to kind of figure out how to do those things sober. And I know when I was drinking, my morals may have been a little off. I may have done some things that I'm not proud of today. In, in AA, I found a sponsor and they walked me through the steps and, you know, I learned how to live a different life. I didn't need to be the same person I was when I was out there drinking. I could be different. I could be the true me. That's it. That's great. Well, let's listen to some more interviews from the Women's Conference. Yeah, I'm Carly. I'm from Austin, Texas and sober since April 30, 2011. I'm here with a group of ladies we met over the pandemic. We have a virtual meeting that we've been attending for like the last, like, I think, three years. And so this is the first time that we've met in person. So we're here and we all got an Airbnb and came together. It's been fun. That's fun. What has made you laugh <laughs> yeah. while you've been here? 
Oh my gosh, the same stuff that makes me laugh in meetings when people are telling their stories and it shouldn't be funny, but it is because I've been there. The woman was talking last night about her history as a prostitute and it's not supposed to be funny, but the way she told it and the way I know that she's not there anymore, you know, was funny. And we were talking in a meeting earlier today about DUIs and jail and you know, the way we used to think. And those, I mean, Lisa and I, we laugh about stuff like that. You know, where we inappropriately laugh in meetings at the stuff you're not supposed to laugh at. But you can because it's a shared thing that you have that used to bring shame and doesn't anymore. And now you can look at it with a different perspective. Yeah, that kind sure. of stuff always makes me laugh. What was the hardest thing for you when you were getting sober? What was the big thing you had to overcome? Oh, gosh. I was pretty angry when I got here. I didn't realize. I thought it was just anger. And so I got here and I was pretty toxic little person in the back, you know, arms crossed and brow furrowed. And I thought I was really angry for a long time and discovered that it was a lot of fear, a lot of sadness, a lot of shame. And so learning how to figure out what those feelings were and that it wasn't anger and learning different ways to feel things that wasn't just being mad, that was pretty difficult. It took a long time, I guess I should say. What do you hope new people in AA, what's a hope for them when they get sober today? That they hear from the people that have you know been here a little while that you're not alone, that like our experiences are not that unique. And so it's like, you know, we get here and we feel really isolated and ashamed and, you know, you get here, you stay long enough and you hear your story a hundred times over. And so just to feel like you're not such a weirdo, you know, you're one of many, you just didn't know who your people were yet. I'm Liza and I'm from Dallas, Texas. Uh, my Friday day is February 8th, 2018. First International Women's Conference. I have been to several of, we have Texas Women's Conference called Girl of Palooza, and so I've been involved with that. <laughs> have you met anybody that's really intrigued you? There are so many women from different places, different points in their sobriety. We had like an impromptu meeting that had, um, you know, somebody who was six months sober all the way to somebody who had 27 years, 40 years. And we were just talking about emotional sobriety and, you know, somebody who's six months sober can be more emotionally sober than somebody who is 40 years sober. And that is just a really good reminder that there is always work to do. And it's not about time. It is about doing the work and surrounding yourself with people who have solution. And that's what this conference has been about, finding people who you say, I want what they have. What have you done? What was the hardest part of getting sober for you? Mm, I think it was definitely feeling like an absolute failure. I just couldn't believe that I couldn't manage my drinking. I didn't want anybody to know that I had just failed. And it took me a really long time to realize that reaching out and asking for help was actually the strongest, bravest thing I'd ever done and something to be really proud of. And now that I think I've flipped that switch, then I've been able to kind of share my experience, strength, and hope around that because I remember what it was like to just feel like a failure and not want anybody to know and just wishing like I could just go on the way that things were. But when you work the steps and you work with a sponsor and you become part of the fellowship, you realize that this is life. Like this is life on life's terms and this is really what, you know, life is about. And I can share that with people who are not in the rooms and they see something different in me. And so it's not something I'm ashamed of anymore. And it's, you know, it's like we will not regret the past, um, you know, or wish to shut the door on it. I mean, I, I wanted to shut that door really hard. Um, but now I can open up and, you know, and talk about it um, openly and not be ashamed of it. You know, I like who I am now. You know, I always thought I was terminally unique and special. And I'm just like everybody else. And, and actually, that's really freeing. Like, I don't have expectations that I have to live up to anymore. I can right. just be me. Hi, I'm Suzanne. I'm from the Knoxville, Tennessee area. My sobriety date is January 11th, 1995. One of the things that I have noticed that's a little bit different about this conference versus others is the fellowship, uh, the activities that you have going on, the entertainment, the, the interaction among people, the tours of the city, a lot of other things that normally you don't get at other conventions. Usually it's just a lot of meetings, which is great, but there's those things in addition to more fun stuff too. Right. I definitely see the unity and the strength among the women in AA. So what's one thing that made you laugh this weekend? 
I have to admit, watching the person come out riding a horse, <laughs> that was different. <laughs> only in Texas. Only in Texas. <laughs> and only in AA. Thank you. Oh my gosh, I wish I could have seen that horse. <laughs> That horse was a treat. I have not been in a conference room in a hotel where a horse has shown up <laughs> star of the show. You know, that was very unexpected. What are your final thoughts on the conference, Cindy? I was blown away. You know, I went on assignment, if you will. Our cub reporter. Oh, exactly. <laughs> but what I saw, what I felt, what I heard was women really enjoying their sobriety women who really know how to walk the walk. I heard all of our principles of Alcoholics Anonymous run through everything they were doing, you know, and I felt like this is something I want to do again. Thanks for going, Cindy, and thanks for bringing all this to us today. Absolutely. You're very welcome. Hey, Sam, can you get that? It's the listener feedback phone. Uh, 212-870-3418. Yeah, hang on. I'll get it. Yellow. Hey, y'all. My name is Peyton, and I'm an alcoholic. I'm from Christopher, Illinois. I just wanted to share some experience I had this weekend that was really, really cool. Um, I attended the Tennessee Conference of Young People in AA, the Tiki Pa. But I was talking to a gal there who was talking about some of her struggles of being Muslim and a member of the fellowship and what those two mean for her and how she's working through that. And I was able to tell her, you know, I can't relate to being a Muslim in AA, but I can relate to alcoholism, and I can tell you where there's some experience to be heard. And it was on the AA Grapevine podcast. I told her a few weeks back, you know, they had a gal speaking that went through very similar struggles, so the experience is out there to be heard. And her faith just lit up and I just thought that was so cool and I thought y'all needed to hear that oh my gosh thanks Peyton a guest said a few weeks ago that's the way AA works when I hear my experience coming from someone's lips hey my name is Brian I'm from Mebane North Carolina calling in about things your sponsor said and it prompted me to a memory of my sponsor at one point when I was about five years sober I had been going to a bunch of meetings, and I told him that I was thinking about maybe I should cut back a little bit so I could increase my social life. So he said, just matter-of-factly, he said, well, if you're going to four or five meetings a week, he said, why don't you cut back one meeting a week and see how that goes. Once you get that, if that works out okay, he said, then you can cut back another meeting a week and see how that goes and so on. When you get drunk, he said, you've gone too far, so you might need to add one back. So... Anyway, he said it so matter-of-factly and calmly, and um, it kind of put that issue to rest. So I uh, really enjoyed the podcast. Thanks for all you guys do. Thanks, Brian. I love it. It's classic. So clever and puts the focus back on the stakes involved with cutting back on participation. You know, in thinking about how many meetings a week I need to stay sober, I took my home group, just took it out of the equation. That's where I'm responsible for making AA happen for others not about me. It's kind of protection against these little games. I might play around with my other meetings, but I don't have a choice on home group night. Thanks, Brian. We love hearing these word from your sponsor calls. Folks, give us some more. You know how to reach us. The Grapevine is looking for your story submissions. Midlife Sobriety. Stories are due April 15th, 2023. Share about some of the challenges you've had after 8, 10, 20 years sober. Have you ever nearly relapsed? Did you ever stop going to meetings or disconnect from AA? Have you ever been a dry drunk? How did you get back on track? What helped you may help someone else. Share your story by April 15, 2023 via aagrapevine.org slash share.
How many alcoholics does it take to change a light bulb? Just one. He holds the light bulb, and the whole world revolves around him. <laughs> <laughs> it's really not that funny. Thanks for joining us. The AA Grapevine Half Hour Variety Hour is posted every Monday and is produced by AA Grapevine, Inc. We don't speak for AA as a whole. We share the experience, strength, and hope of members to help others recover from alcoholism. Podcast info, including how to call in, is at aagrapevine.org slash podcast. Find AA Grapevine on Instagram and the AA Grapevine channel on YouTube. All things Grapevine are available at aagrapevine.org. If you want to know more about AA, Google Alcoholics Anonymous and your city or visit aa.org.